All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the NIH Director's Transformative Research Award. Um, uh, we have a great panel for you today to help answer your questions. Um, we are going to primarily focus, um, after some brief presentations, we're going to focus primarily on questions that were submitted to our email box. Um, however, as we go through the discussion, if um, questions pop into your head, feel free to um, submit them to us. You can do that uh, on the WebEx Q&A box. If you go to the WebEx toolbar, um, there'll be a tab that says more on it with three little dots. If you click on that, you'll see that there's a, a link to a Q&A that will pop that up. Um, so submit your questions there. Um, if you have other issues you can um, that are not related to the award, um, or technical issues, you can submit them through the chat. But if you do have questions of, of, of relevance to the Transformative Research Award, once again, please submit it through the Q&A box. Um, if we are unable to get to your questions or you feel like it was not answered sufficiently, um, you can always email us. We're at transformative underscore awards at mail.nih.gov. Um, you can also go to our website and there's um, our email addresses there as well. Um, we will be focusing uh, primarily on well, more generalized questions. If you have very specific questions or uh, questions about the scientific scope or the proposal of your proposal, we ask that you please submit those through our, our email box um, where it's easier to offer, uh, answer those offline. All right, with that, um, this webinar is being recorded. It will be posted on our website uh, at that commonfund.nih.gov slash tra. TRA. Um, so you can view that probably within a week. We'll have that posted there on that homepage. And we will also provide the slides. So you can download the slides and watch the webinar from there. Um, all right. So I think that's it uh, to begin with. We would just like to introduce our panel. Um, there's a lot of us today. I'm Becky Miller. I'm a program officer uh, in the office of the director. We also have Ravi Basavapa joining us. He is the program leader for the High Risk High Reward Research Program, and he's our fearless leader. Um, and also from our office is Ellie Mercia. She is a program specialist, and she's the one who keeps me and Ravi on task and helps us with all of our all of our budget issues and makes sure that we're we're in line. Um, we're also glad to have. Uh, James Lee here with us. He's a scientific review officer in charge of the Transformative Research Award review. Um, so he'll be speaking with us today uh, about that process. And he's at the Center for Scientific Review. Uh, we also have Tony Kirilusha, who's uh, from NIAMS. He is a working group member for the High Risk High Reward Research Program and is here to help answer some of your questions. And we also have um, Amelia Gubitz, who is um, from NINDS. Uh, she is a special contact for this new ALS2 program that uh, you may have heard about. Where there's um, a special notice of special interest in funding, so she will also be talking to us about that. All right, so I think we're ready to start, Ravi. Okay, thank you all for joining the webinar today for the Transformative Research Award Program. I'd first like to provide a little bit of background talk a bit about the Common Fund, and then uh, a little about the High Risk High Reward Program in general before launching into details about the Transformative Research Award Initiative. So the Common Fund is in the office of the uh, NIH Director, and it's administered by uh, an office called the Office of Strategic Coordination. The objective of the Common Fund as a whole is to support initiatives, programs that really have the potential for broad trans NIH impact programs that one institute at NIH or maybe a couple couldn't uh, be able to, to uh, launch and manage by themselves because of the scale of, of what's being proposed, for example. The, there are about 27 or so uh, current common fund programs, and they can be cate categorized into four different groups. For example, the data tools and methods group, uh, an example of this would be Glycomics, uh, as you know, doing glycoscience, um, sorry, glycoscience program. As you know, doing glycoscience is a notoriously challenging endeavor, although it's uh, very important to broad area of biology. So to help democratize glycoscience research, then this program is seeking to 
uh, make accessible to the community reagents that are relevant to them or uh, new instrumentation or protocols that that they may be that uh, investigators may find useful. Another type of, of program in the Common Fund is new types of clinical partnerships. An example of this is undiagnosed diseases network. Uh, through this network, then institutions across the nation come together to help diagnose patients who have had a, who have or are suffering pretty severe symptoms, but uh, nobody really knows why. This this program helps to identify such causes and uh, and perhaps uh, identify new diseases or conditions. Uh, the third category is new paradigms. An example of this is the 4DN nucleome, 4DN. The objective of this is ambitious. It's uh, to determine the, the structure of the nucleome in space and in time, the four dimensions. And finally, the fourth category is transformative, transformative workforce support. An example, a prime example of this is the high-risk, high-reward research program, something that we're going to talk more about today. But I tell you about the Common Fund because uh, the Common Fund programs may be very useful for the research that you're conducting in your own laboratory. For example, these programs may have active FOAs uh, that uh, may help to support what you're doing or planning to do in your own laboratory. Through these programs, you may also find access to high-end instrumentation that would be very beneficial to you, you know, that maybe uh, a single lab or even an institution couldn't afford by itself, but uh, uh, but something that would be very beneficial to your own research effort. The common fund programs also often, often have uh, databases, reagents, and protocols that could be very useful to you as you uh, try to conduct your research. So uh, I encourage you to check out the common fund website, commonfund.nih.gov, to see uh, the more, in addition to just a lot of the interesting science and programs that we support, but also see if anything's relevant and useful to you. Okay, next slide, please. Everybody, the focus today is on the high risk, high reward research program. Next slide. So, some general characteristics about the high risk, high reward research program or the HR, HR program. It consists of four initiatives the Pioneer Awards, the New Innovator Awards, the Transformative Research Awards, and the Early Independence Awards. So a lot of information about these various initiatives are on our Common Fund website. Um, but some things in common are that each of these initiatives has an annual funding opportunity, has had, and we expect that that will continue. So there's typically one receipt date, uh, usually in August or September, and uh, the FOAs are usually published in, in uh, late spring or early summer. Another common feature of the, this program is that all four initiatives seek to support high risk, high impact ideas, things that really are outside the box and uh, couldn't be supported by more conventional NIH funding, but if successful, would have a huge impact. Next slide, please. None of these initiatives requires uh, preliminary data, and that's really true. Uh, we try ver our very best to, uh, to emphasize that in the FOA and also to educate the reviewers not to expect uh, data. Data, are, data uh, are not forbidden. They can be provided, and if provided, they will be evaluated, but they are not expected. And that's generally, genuinely true. Need, none of these initiatives also requires a detailed experimental plan because these are supposed to be high risk endeavors. And even, uh, the applicants typically have not, don't know all the details yet of how, how actually they will execute the research. Okay. Another thing I'd like to emphasize is that, in a sense, this is the investigator initiated program in the Common Fund, whereas the other Common Fund programs have particular scientific objectives. Uh, they hope to achieve within their at most 10 year project um, program period. Anything that's within the broad mission of NIH is welcome. Uh, it's up to the applicant to, to choose the topic of, of his or her proposal. The only constraint is that it has to be relevant to NIH. And we mean that in a very broad sense. Next slide, please. And that we welcome behavioral, uh, social, biomedical, applied, and formal science research, and uh, research may be characterized as basic, translational, or clinical. And if you are looking on our website and you see that maybe 
uh, transformative research award in your particular area has not been uh, supported yet, that doesn't mean that you should not apply. That means that maybe it's a good opportunity for you to apply because we really do try to diversify our scientific portfolio. Next slide, please. Uh, a, an important point is that we encourage applications from investigators with diverse backgrounds and applications from the full spectrum of eligible institutions. So there's a vast untapped scientific potential in this country. Uh, we want to tap into that as best as we can. Outstanding high risk high reward type research is done in many different places across the nation, uh, you know, in many different states, in many different types of institutions. Uh, for example, even a, a, for example, an institution that whose focus is primarily on teaching, you know, there may be researchers there who have brilliant ideas and uh, that might be quite well suited for this program and we encourage applications from them as well. So we want to tap into the full potential of uh, scientific potential of this nation. Next slide, please. But before I begin uh, to get into details about the Transformative Research Award program, I would like to give a shout out to the High Risk High Reward Research Working Group. The HRHR program is a large program with many moving parts, and to help uh, make those parts move uh, in, a, uh, in a very nice way and to crank the HRHR machine, as I say, we have the, the support of uh, this working group. It has representation from almost all the ICs at NIH. The members on this working group help to formulate the policies for the HRHR program as well as to uh, develop funding plans and to serve as a liaison between the Common Fund HR, HR program and their respective institutes. So thanks to the working group for making this possible. Okay, now a little bit of detail about the Transformative Research Award program. The intention of this program is to support exceptionally innovative or unconventional research projects with the potential to create or overturn fundamental paradigms that was started in 2009, uh, this was during the Enhancing Peer Review Program um, process. At that time, it was recognized that the, uh, as you may know about the Pioneer Awards and New Innovator Awards, they're already in existence, but they're single PI uh, applications only, and the budgets are fixed. So it was recognized at that time that, there's a, that there was really no mechanism through which people could support uh, proposed ideas that require different budgets, small budgets or larger budgets than the Pioneer or New Innovator uh, Awards allow, or there was no, or, and that there was also no way for teams of investigators to come together. Uh, for the Transformative Research Award, single PI applications as well as multi-PI applications are welcome. As with the other initiatives, no preliminary data are required. The budgets are flexible. We've had people in the past five years or so uh, propose budgets successfully that ranged by an order of magnitude anywhere in the 200,000s to a bit over $2 million. So anything that's, uh, so budgets can really be flexible, but it has to be commensurate with the scope of the project being uh, proposed. Speaking of which, no prior approval is required for large budget requests. So if it's over $500,000 in direct costs in any particular year, you don't need to seek prior approval because the FOA explicitly states that large budgets are okay. An important point is that the uh, Transformative Research Award, though, although it's an R01, it cannot be renewed. People can submit uh, applications for a second Transformative Research Award, but they can't extend an existing Transformative Research Award through a Type 2 application. Okay. Next slide, please. And a bit of background before I get into more specifics about the application is that the High Risk High Reward Research Program in general enjoys a lot of scrutiny both from outside as, from both outside NIH as well as within NIH. An example is that Dr. Collins uh, in 2018 convened a working group to his advisory committee to the director and asked this working group of the ACD to examine the HRHR program for effectiveness and whether there are any bias, apparent biases in the, in the program. The uh, working group made its final report and recommendations in June 2019 
and they found that the HRHR program is effective in supporting unusually innovative and impactful research. They also found that underrepresented groups overall are not adversely affected by the review process. But they identified a more fundamental concern, something that we were also aware of, is that underrepresented groups do not apply at a rate that really reflects their composition in the workforce. The working group also noted that awards really tend to go to a subset of institutions, although there are so many you know, uh, potential institutions in this nation that can submit applications. The applications and awards tend to go to a pretty small subset of the institutions. So one recommendation the working group made is to pilot anonymized review. And we will be piloting anonymized review for the Transformative Research Award this year. But if you want to find out more about the working group and uh, the full set of findings and recommendations, I encourage you to go to the link that's given uh, in, the, in this slide. Okay, next slide, please. So with that context and background about the anonymized review, uh, I can discuss a little bit about the TRA application itself and how it's going to be adapted for anonymized review. So since 2009, we've been using the R01 application package, but in a very unconventional way. Uh, we still have a specific games page, but we use the specific games page in an unusual manner. Instead of asking applicants to enumerate two, three, or four specific games that they hope to achieve during the course of the project, we instead ask the applicants to use this as a one-page distillation of the entire project and why it is well aligned with the spirit of the trans transformative research award initiative. It has two, uh, we ask applicants to divide this page into two sections, significance, innovation, and impact, as well as insight and rationale, and to elaborate on those particular points in this one page. The research strategy section is also used, but in a different way. It, it's, uh, as per usual, it's limited to 12 pages. But we're, instead of uh, asking applicants to provide an overview of the project and provide substantial preliminary data and uh, experimental details, something that both applicants and reviewers expect in this section, we instead ask them to use it to address items of programmatic importance to the TRA initiative. So instead of the conventional format, we ask applicants to, uh, to use these particular subheadings or split into these five subsections, the overview of the research project and set the context for the project. As James will uh, tell you when he discusses the review process, not all applicants, not all reviewers are subject matter experts. So you have to be sure that people who are well outside the field can easily appreciate why what you're proposing is exceptionally innovative and has the potential for unusually broad impact. And so helping set the context, uh, set, provide the landscape of the field, what the current state of the art is, what the boundaries are, and state in very clear, concrete terms how what you're proposing will uh, push well past the current boundaries. The approach, so here you describe not so much experimental details or provide data. And in fact, in the FOA, we instruct you, the applicant, to state in your application that per the FOA, you are not uh, providing substantial preliminary data or uh, providing a detailed experimental plan. So that helps you, the applicant, to stay on track and say, hey, this is a transformative research award application. But perhaps more importantly, uh, it also helps to keep the RO, the reviewers on track as well. If they read in the application itself that, uh, the, that since this is a transformative research award application, not much data or a detailed experimental plan are being provided, we think that really helps the, RO, the reviewers to, to stay on track. It's easy for NIH reviewers to slip into the R01 mindset and start looking for details and data. But if it says right there, hey, this is a TRA application, not a standard R01 application, we think it helps. So although you don't provide much, many details or a detailed experimental plan, still the logic that you provide should be compelling. You can't say, oh, I'm going to cure cancer or diabetes or Alzheimer's. Yeah, I gotta back it up with something substantial, something that's really compelling. And you also must convince reviewers that what you are uh, proposing will be conducted robustly and rigorously. 
you're also asked to uh, address explicitly the innovation. Why is what you're proposing so exceptionally innovative? Here again, it really helps to set the context for the field and why did what you're proposing was something that no other groups or people are really thinking about that you're bringing in a very different perspective. The another section that you are asked to uh, include and uh, elaborate on is the appropriateness for the TRA. Explain why this is a, hit, a high risk high reward application and not a traditional R01. Why what you're proposing really wouldn't fare well in conventional NIH reviews and other way to uh, perceive this. Finally, you're asked to provide a timeline, include critical decision points, what you're proposing should be high risk. So you haven't worked out all the details yet. Here we ask you to, uh, to elaborate on when you'll make decisions on how to divert or pivot your research to, so that you still are able to achieve the overall ob objectives, but uh, things you'll have to consider along the way, uh, particular junctures, important junctures in the overall research trajectory. Next slide, please. So some points to consider when you are writing your uh, transformative research award application. Again, given that not all reviewers will be topic experts, don't expect all the reviewers to have the same level of expertise that you would expect for a standard R01 review. Some people will be very well outside the field of your application. Make sure that what you write can be easily appreciated by people who don't know much about the science being proposed, but are well-known scientists who have a broad scientific perspective, but not are not spot-on experts. So again, begin with the description of the landscape of the field. Ease the reader into the jargon of the field. Don't, uh, don't jump in too quickly. <laughs> Ease the reader into the concepts and uh, the language of the field. Though no detailed experimental plan is required, make clear what it is that you want to do and why you want to do it. Convince the reviewers that you indeed have thought deeply about the project, that, for example, you've identified risky aspects, how they will be mitigated, that you've thought of alternate approaches, you know, that these are the major potential pitfalls, but uh, I, rec we, I or we recognize those, and this is how we will try to mitigate those. Also convince the reviewers that the research will be performed in a robust and rigorous manner. For example, if you're um, proposing to develop a new technology or technique, how are you going to validate your, the, the new approach? You should definitely be sure to include that. If you're going to use animal subjects or human subjects in the research strategy section, you should uh, provide some numbers of the subjects you plan to use and a rationale for why, for example, some sort of power analysis would be very good, and that you'll be using important biological variables such as sex. So those should be in the in the research strategy section itself. It should, they should not be relegated, for example, to the vertebrate animal section or the human subjects uh, component of the application. So given uh, that we know a bit about the TRA application and how it differs from the uh, standard R01 application format, now I'd like to elaborate a bit on how we're going to anonymize it this year. For the anonymized review, the specific aims page and the 12-page research strategy must be anonymized. That is, they must not contain the following. They must not contain, of course, names of any individuals or institutions participating in the research mention of any honors or awards, like oh, I won a Nobel Prize in this, for example. Hyperlinks, uh, reference to any investigator attributes or accomplishments, such as as leaders in the field, or we, sh we have shown previously that citations that provide specific information about the source uh, should not be included in these sections. Instead, you're welcome to use uh, and expected to use citations, but use only numeric citations, refer which refer to the corresponding source in the bibliography and references cited uh, component of the application. And in general, any other text from which the identity of any participating individual or institution can be reasonably inferred. Uh, and we will be pretty stringent in how we vet applications for this. After the applications are received, we'll have, we at NIH will go through the applications and make sure that they do not contain any information that would breach confidentiality or, or anonymity of the applicant or institution. 
inclusion of any such information will result in the application being administratively withdrawn. So please be very careful in how and what to include uh, in the in these, uh, particularly in these two components. But for the other application components, you use a standard SF424 instructions. You bio sketch will be required. All the other components, if they're um, appropriate, will be required, and you're free to include your identity as well as any participating institution or collaborators. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's an important point about anonymity and anonymized review. Another unusual feature for the Transformative Research Award is that this year it has three flavors. We have the usual standard, not the vanilla, but the standard flavor, any topic of relevance to the, uh, for this, any topic uh, of relevance to the NIH mission is welcome. That's the standard uh, Transformative Research Award, FOA, RM20-013. We also, given the pandemic, have a, another companion FOA, the COVID-19 related FOA, which uses money from the CARES Act and um, is considered an emergency FOA. So research submitted in response to this FOA must be relevant to the SARS-CoV-2 prevention, preparation, or response. Uh, but any topic that's relevant to COVID-2 uh, is welcome. This, it doesn't necessarily have to be basic biology about the virus or immunology or therapeutics, diagnostics. It could very well include behavioral social science research, research on health disparities, uh, as well as novel therapeutics. So anything that within the mission of NIH that could uh, have some bearing on our response to SARS-CoV-2 or prevention or preparation. As with the standard TRA, the uh, the innovation for this FOA may be technical and or conceptual. Usually successful applications are a combination of both technical and conceptual innovation. But like the uh, standard TRA, the, what's being proposed must uh, have a very high level of innovation. The and application submitted to the, uh, be sure that if you are proposing COVID-19 related research, that it is submitted in response to this FOA. The third flavor of uh, the Transformative Research Award being offered this year is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS-related research. And uh, we recently issued a notice of special interest, RM20-019, for this particular flavor. Uh, but overall, for all, and I'll provide a little more details about that in the next couple of slides. But importantly, all uh, applications, regardless of flavor, have the same receipt date, September 30th, 2020, and all will use the anonymized review process with the same study section. Okay. Next slide, please. So a bit more about ALS and ALS squared. We have Amelie Gubitz from NINDS to, to help. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Ravi. So I am very pleased to briefly introduce the Accelerating Leading Edge Science in ALS program. So um, this is a pilot for this year. It's a companion program, which is focused on ALS. It's a companion to the Transformative Research Award program that Ravi just um, explained in much detail. So the goal of ALS Squared is to incentivize innovative and interdisciplinary research on ALS. And as many of you may know, ALS is a very progressive and always fatal neurological disease that affects motor neurons. And it typically strikes people in midlife and most patients die of the disease between three to five years. So um, about 10% of ALS are inherited, they're genetic, but um, for the majority of patients, the etiology is unknown, it's considered as sporadic. And certainly, although there has been a lot of scientific progress over the past 10 to 20 years, there are still a lot of knowledge gaps that we really have to overcome to um, get to treatments for ALS. So ALS squared was um, recently announced in a notice of special interest. And um, so Ravi already um, mentioned the number. And um, so the key is that this is a partnership between the Common Fund and four institutes at um, NIH, including the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke as well as the National Institute in Aging, 
the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and finally also the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. Next slide, please. And um, so ALS squared um, is taking essentially a three-pronged um, approach to accelerate ALS research. Um, so the first um, approach that we would like to emphasize is um, the adoption of emerging technologies to ALS research. And these technologies can be from any scientific discipline, from the neurosciences, from cell biology, or whatever you, you are able to apply to ALS. And the goal is to better understand disease mechanisms, etiology of ALS, especially sporadic ALS. And we're also very much interested in attracting new talent from a diversity of um, scientific disciplines. So there is going to be um, an emphasis on multidisciplinary approaches. And finally, we are also very interested in understanding disease convergence, so shared pathobiologies with other neurodegenerative diseases or other diseases that affect the nervous system. But otherwise, all of the other general criteria and processes of the TRA program apply to the ALS squared initiative. So the application will be very similar. It's just um, that the focus will be on ALS. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Amelie. And now we can move to Jim James, who will describe the review process. So you can hear me OK, right? OK, so can I have the second slice? OK, so um, so here's the first slide. Basically, it's an overview of the review process for this uh, Transformative Research Award. And uh, this is the one, as Ravi alluded to earlier, we're going to use for a regular transformative uh, uh, <clears throat> research award review as well as for the uh, two subcategory, uh, COVID-19 related and uh, AIOS related. We will use a editorial board review format to conduct the review. This is essentially the same sort of a, a similar, very similar process that we used uh, for the past uh, 10 years or so. Uh, in addition, this year we're also piloting an uh, anonymized review process where the identity of the, uh, the PI and the, the team, the key personnel and the institution, uh, the information were not disclosed to the uh, review panel during the phase one, two, and three A, and only, only at the last at this, uh, phase three B, where the final review discussion um, meeting, at that stage, the, the editor board review panel will have the access to the complete application. This, uh, uh, you know, the the PI and the team and the institution, everything will be considered uh, during the final discussion. So uh, maybe you can move on to the uh, next slide. So we'll give a, a little bit of detail on each phase. So, um, so typically the editorial board review panel is composed of a 16 to 20 senior scientists with a broad um, expertise carving, uh, covering uh, essentially the diverse scientific area that are funded by an energy research portfolio. And uh, each uh, editorial board member will review approximately 50 applications. Uh, in phase one, that's uh, solely based on the specific aim page. Uh, and uh, so that's a, essentially, it's like a high level uh, sort of a evaluation, a sort of a uh, distillation of the ideas or, or overall concept uh, for your project. And uh, so they will assess why, you know, your project's exceptional, innovative, and it's a potential transformative impact, right? Obviously, uh, at this stage, they are not considering any technical details or preliminary data, and it's really a, a high-level uh, assessment. And uh, each application is going to be reviewed by uh, four editorial board members, and uh, then they will score those op uh, these applications. And typically, uh, in the past, a top 70 to 80 applications plus any application that will be uh, uh, rescued by the uh, by the uh, but the reviewer will be moved to the uh, phase two stage review. This year, with uh, there will be additional application in the area of COVID and ALS uh, that will be selected for the phase two uh, review on top of the typical 70, 80 application we normally do. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so in the phase two, um, 
applications. So the top 70, 80 plus uh, additional one for this year will be distributed to various um, IRGs within the uh, NHS Center for Scientific Review uh, group that generally cover the, 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 the the area for science within the each application, right? So at that stage, for each application, three uh, topic sub uh, topic expert are recruited as a male reviewer, who uh, who um, will provide a, a, a sort of a more like a technical assessment uh, of the application. They will have access. Uh, the this review will have uh, um, access to your specific aim page as well as the twelve page research strategy section. And uh, the, this main review uh, will um, address the significance and the state of art in the field and the level of innovation and its transformative potential and the logic of the approach. Right? Uh, once again, uh, in this stage of the review, uh, the, the, uh, the technical expert um, will not know the identity of the uh, PI and um, or institution. Uh, next next slides, please. Then once the uh, the male reviewer uh, the comment um, comes in, the editor board member will have access to the specific aim page and the research strategy section, as well as the corresponding technical reviewer from the uh, phase two male reviewer. Uh, at this stage, once again, each uh, Editor um, review member were assigned to approximately about 20 application. They were reviewed um, the application and provide, provide another preliminary score, taking into account both their own assessment as well as the input from the mail review. Right, and uh, a list of the rank will be generated. Generally, the top 50 percent of uh, from the list uh, will be um, moved to the next phase uh, for the discussion. Still, uh, even at the three, uh, phase three, uh, three A, it's still being done under the anonymized uh, process at this point. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now uh, uh, we come to the uh, final review discussion, right? So at this point, all the um, editorial board member will have full access to the complete application. They will consider the five standard review criteria, including investigator and environment, as well as a human subject, clinical trial, design, vertebrate animal, multi pi plan for the final review discussion. And uh, after the discussion, uh, the panel member will provide the final overall impact score, uh, taking into account both their own assessment of the entire application and input from the panel discussion, as well as the, the input from the main review. So, so that's a sort of the uh, overall uh, review process. Already of our questions, questions were submitted to our mailbox earlier. Um, however, if we have time, we will get to the questions that you are submitting to us right now through the WebEx Q&A chat box. Sorry, Q&A Q &A box um, at the WebEx. So go ahead and you can type your questions in there and time permitting, we will get to them. Um, once again, if we do not get to your questions here or we don't answer them sufficiently, uh, you can email us at transformative underscore awards at mail.nih.gov and we can answer those offline. Um, uh, as a reminder as well, we are recording this webinar and we will be posting it along with the slides on our website at commonfund.nih.gov slash tra. Um, probably in a week or so once we get clearance for them. Um, so they'll be posted there. You can look at it. While you're there, you can also take a look at our brand new application and award guidance website that we've created. It gives you more, um, more guidance, step-by-step -step guidance on how to apply and more about award management. And it includes two sample applications from previous um, awardees. So you can go and look at those proposals um, on our website there as well. And it's a good source for you to get some more of your questions answered. 
All right, we will be launching now into the Q and A. And um, let's see, I'm going to try to keep this all straight. So we've broken this up into different sections. Uh, the first group of questions that we'll be we'll be um, answering are about eligibility. And so I think uh, Tony, can you help us out with these? Um, so of course. Uh, yeah, we've got questions on what is meant by transformative research. So I think the, the best way to think about it are that there are two questions to ask. Uh, first of all, is the idea that's being proposed really innovative or is it something that's already been in the mainstream for a while? And the second part is if it is successful, is it going to lead to a radical change in the field, potentially have impact in other fields and is it going to create a completely new concept or a technology or radically alter the way we think about something? And if the answer to those questions is yes, then it is a transformative concept. Great, thank you. Um, and we've had a few questions about this too. Um, are multiple PIs allowed to apply and are individuals or teams preferred? So, so that's an interesting question because the transformative R01 is actually the only one of the four HR, HR initiatives uh, that allows multi-PI applications. A and the answer is, it, it depends. Uh, there is absolutely no preference in terms of evaluation, whether it's a single PI or a multi-PI application. Uh, what you should consider when applying, uh, if you would like to make this a multi-PI team, are the different PIs bringing complementary expertise together that enhances both the impact and the feasibility of the proposal? And can you develop a reasonable and implementable leadership sharing plan? And if the answer, once again, is yes to both questions, then by all means, uh, send in a multi-PI application. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, and we also have a question online. Um, Maybe you or Ravi could answer this. Um, are two applications acceptable from one PI? Um, and can you have, can you hold two, two awards? So I can take a stab at this and then see if Ravi wants to uh, add anything to it. Uh, the answer as always is yes, provided that they are very scientifically distinct. So what you can't have are two applications that have either scientific overlap, they're essentially the same or very similar concept, or that have a lot of budgetary overlap where you're actually asking for equipment or samples that will be used in both cases. Uh, but as long as they're, as they're completely distinct proposals, uh, you are more than welcome to submit as many as you have time for. And okay. Um, oh, Ravi, this is probably for you. Success rate. <laughs> how many applications do you get? Um, how many are you awarding? What's the success rate? Yeah, typically we get between 150 to 250 applications each year. We don't know how many applications we'll receive this year, but past few years the overall success rate success rate has been about three to five percent. So it's pretty competitive. All right. All right, um, Tony, uh, what about applications proposing clinical research? Um, are they appropriate for this award? So that's also a very interesting question. The short answer is yes, uh, but they do have an extra degree of complexity associated with them because we're looking for concepts that are very innovative. And as a result, that presents an extra dimension of risk to the participants in the clinical trial. And so we, we do have guidelines for evaluating that, but the one thing I will mention is that I strongly encourage anyone considering submitting a clinical trial application to reach out to their IC or to the most appropriate IC and talk about guidelines that might be applicable to this. Uh, but yes, clinical trials are allowed. Yes. And if I may add to that, we have a link in the FOA that uh, leads to a list of contacts for the HRHR program of who uh, across institutes and these individuals can can discuss clinical or re related research that's relevant to their institute. Thank you. 
All right. Um, so uh, will technology development be allowed or only hypothesis driven research? Uh, the answer is both. So if the technology is going to be transformative and if it's going to help us change the way we think about something or gather data that we here to weren't able to gather and answer an important question, then uh, the answer is yes, that is appropriate. And hypothesis driven proposals are also appropriate. It, it depends on the transformative uh, potential more so than on the specific methodology or the presentation of the concept. Um, uh, Ravi, um, risk is very subjective. How risky should the proposal be? Or being transformative, is being transformative the more important criterion? Being transformative is the most important criterion. Uh, but that being said, you know, risk, you, you shouldn't violate more than one uh, law of physics. <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, but risk is really in the eye of the uh, beholder. In this case, uh, the reviewer. So you have to, you have to, and you also have to really push the concept a little bit. Not, not something that would be seen as a logical extension of what's happening in the field, but a real leap for the field. Excellent. All right. Um, no awards have been made for my area of science. Does that mean my science area is not competitive or of interest to the program? Uh, not at all. Actually, uh, we want to see applications from any area that is relevant to the NIH mission. And the NIH mission itself now might actually be a good opportunity to literally read the sentence is to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. So anything that fits within that broad mission is an appropriate application. And if, it has, if your area hasn't been funded yet, uh, it may mean that you should just submit another application or think about uh, ways of updating the concept uh, because uh, we review these every year and we want to see applications from as diverse uh, a group of fields and ideas as possible. Great. Thank you. Um, Amelie, um, there's a question here about uh, the proportion of funds to the number of awards for um, the ALS uh, initiative as well as the standard um, and COVID. Maybe you can answer about the ALS. So for the ALS, um... There was um, an announcement by NIH, and NIH is setting aside $25 million over five years. So per year, it's um, $5 million that could potentially be invested in these grants. Of course, it depends whether the applications are meritorious and whether they are scored well by peer review, but it's about $5 million per year. And um, it depends on you know, the quality of the applications. And are there going to be pay lines for the ALS um, applications? I mean, none of this is going to be percentiled, and um, we will sort of look at the score order, but that's hard to predict how the scores will fall. I mean, we look for high quality research, and it's too early to tell, you know, what score will be in the fundable range. And Ravi, maybe you can speak to the COVID and the standard trough. For the COVID-19 related FOA, uh, like for the ALS squared, we will also, approximately, this is a very rough figure still, but maybe $25 million over five years, which would be, again, $5 million per year. The complication in this case is that we're sharing that same pot of money with the COVID-19 related uh, FOA for the early independence awards, the, the sister initiative within the HR program. So. We'll have to see how the, the applications for both COVID-19 related FOAs uh, play out, now, how many applications we receive and how we wish to, to share funds among those two initiatives. Excellent. And speaking for the regular, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. For the regular, uh, we you know each year we set up uh, sides between six to eight million dollars uh, to, to support competing applications. 
And again, it depends on the budgets and uh, the number of quality applications that we get. Not all applications are supported in, in priority score order. Most of the applications are, but we do exercise programmatic discretion uh, for a fairly significant fraction of the awards that we make. Great. Um, speaking of COVID, uh, Tony, um, is there any chance that awards that uh, awards will start before September of 2021, given the emergency of COVID-19? Uh, the, the short answer is no, that is not going to happen. And the start dates for the awards are going to be in September of uh, uh, 2021. Uh, we do have other funding opportunities uh, with quicker start dates uh, that are there to address the COVID-19 emergency and, and we're always continuing to work on that, but the HRHR awards will start in September. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, I, uh, here's another question. Uh, I applied last time and was not funded and received no feedback. Is there any point in applying again with the same transformative idea? Uh, there is. Uh, this is uh, just like any other uh, grant application process. So it, it, it can be a little disheartening to not receive feedback, but as Ravi mentioned in the beginning, this is uh, an there's an extremely large pool of applicants with uh, several stages of review. And uh, just because the application uh, didn't advance very far this year doesn't mean it can't be improved and uh, resubmitted next year. As long as you believe that this is still a transformative and valuable idea, we encourage you to continue applying. Right. All right. Um, and are there any eligibility restrictions based on nationality, et cetera? Uh, Actually, can I defer that one to Ravi because I don't remember that off the top of my head. Well, as you can see, there's nothing on the much on the top of my head, but in any case, <laughs> but in any case, uh, no, there's there's no citizenship requirements or uh, nationality requirements. You just have to be uh, have legal status in the country. It doesn't citizenship doesn't matter. All right, and for the institution has to be at a U.S has to be at a U.S. domestic institution. Yes. Um, and for multiple PIs, can we have four PIs with complementary expertise uh, for one proposal? Yes. As, as, as I mentioned before, as long as it's clear what each PI is bringing to the table and as long as the leadership plan is well-defined, you can have as small or as large of a team as you feel appropriate. Right. And can for-profit small businesses apply? And are they less likely to be awarded than an academic institution? So, so that's an interesting question and I'll, I'll answer it in two parts. So the first part is yes, small businesses and for-profits can absolutely apply and they will receive exactly the same consideration during review as an application from an academic or a nonprofit institution would. So in that sense, they're treated exactly the same. Uh, one of the issues is that we just don't get very many applications uh, from uh, small businesses and for-profits. Uh, a part of that could be that there are uh, very specific uh, reporting and disclosure requirements that are associated with federal funding. And uh, I am happy to defer to other panelists if there are any other considerations there, but that's uh, what I can say. Nothing to add. Okay. Um, if, P if multiple PIs are from different institutions, is the process, I'm assuming the application process, the same? Uh, mm -hmm. I think so. Yes. Okay. There will be one contact institution as for other multi-PI R01 applications. And one contact PI, right. memory serves. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, um, does this application need a faculty position? The requirements are the same as for the other research project uh, proposals. So it, it really is at the discretion of the institution. If the position that the principal investigator is occupying is one that the institution that has institutional support, uh, then they're eligible. 
Okay. All right, and we've gotten quite a few questions asking about the difference between the Pioneer and Transformative Research Award. Ah, uh, so, so that's an interesting question, and, and this one I'm also going to have to answer in stages. So they are similar because they both focus on transformative technologies. Uh, the way to think about it is that the Pioneer Award is more investigator-centered. So the concept has to be transformative, uh, but it is viewed in the context of the particular investigator's prior field of inquiry. And it has to show a significant departure from what this investigator was working on previously. Uh, and it also has to be something that this investigator is willing to dedicate a very significant portion of their effort. There's a 51% effort requirement on the Pioneer Award, at least for the first three years. Uh, the transformative R01 is completely concept-based, and it doesn't have the effort requirements. The effort must be commensurate with the plan that is proposed, but it doesn't have to be 51%. Uh, the other difference is that the Pioneer Award has a set budget. It's $700,000 direct cost, and the Transformative Award does not have a defined budget, although the absolute upper limit is $8 million. And uh, the, the larger the budget, uh, the more rigorous and compelling the justification for it has to be. Uh, but th those are the main distinctions to think about when choosing which announcements to apply to. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there's another question asking if research on plants are eligible for consideration. Uh, I'm sorry, Becky, could you sure. say that one more eligible, time? Um, research on plants, if that is um, eligible as, for this. As long as it has relevance to the NIH mission, it is uh, more than welcome to apply. Okay, excellent. Oh, wow, we are going long on time. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I think we need to move on to our next section, which is on application and submission. All right, so we've gotten quite a few questions about how long the project period can be. Is this me? Uh, yeah, yeah, or who? can be up to can be up to five years. So you can propose less than five, though, is typically. Uh, five years, we get very few applications proposing a shorter project period. And are there example applications to look at? Yes, we now have two example applications, but should warn you that they are not um, there before the anonymized experiment that we're conducting. So there'll be a standard transformative research award applications that included uh, information about the investigator and institution in the specific themes page and research strategy sections. Um, Would you still be able to get an overall sense of the framework that's been used successfully? Okay, great. Um, and how many pages um, for the research strategy section? Twelve. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, how do you handle applications where access to specific resources of data may be an identifying factor? How do you? Um, so applications where they um, are talking about specific data sources, um, mm -hmm. by listing those data sources, it may actually identify the investigator. How will that be handled um, for the anonymized review process? Well, as long as you comply as best as you can uh, with the instructions in the FOA, one way in we're mitigating the risk of being able to identify reviewers, I think, I mean, uh, applicants is that, uh, as James uh, described in the review process, in the first phase, people from very different scientific backgrounds who probably don't know much about the particular area of science that that uh, about your particular area of science will be reading the application. They'll have one page. And on that one page, they will have, be asked to evaluate uh, innovation, potential impact. They probably will uh, they probably will not know enough about the field to be able to infer the identity of the applicant. Uh, later on in the technical review phase, uh, we just have to comply with the instructions as best as you can. The uh, 
Um, it has, it's, it's a concern of us too, of what happens if the reviewers are able to identify applicants, uh, if, although they do comply with the instructions. So we are, this is an experiment and we are planning to closely monitor and evaluate the, the anonymized review process to see if we need to make any modifications. But I think the best guidance is to follow the, the FOA instructions as best as you can. Um, and uh, is there an advantage for submitting early between the August 30th and September 30th deadline? No, there's no advantage. Um, do applications fare better if they include preliminary data? Preliminary data are not required, and that's certainly the case. We've had applications that have not provided data at all and were successful. Most applications do provide some data to so to give a glimmer of hope that whatever is being proposed can actually be achieved. But if you provide too much data, that can actually work against you because the reviewers will may say, "Oh, everything looks imminent, eminently feasible. It's better suited for a, a conventional R1 than a transformative research award." All right. And do letters of support need to hide the identity of the PI or institution? The letters of support, no, the letters of support will not be available to the anonymized phases in the anonymized phases of review. All right. Um, and how should you include citations in the research strategy essay? You can use numbers and which refer to unique uh, citations that are listed in the bibliography and citations section of the application. And can I include links, I guess hyperlinks in the research strategy essay if they might identify me? No, no, that's stated in the FOA, hyperlinks are not allowed. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, mm -hmm. Our, let's see, are research projects that propose innovative secondary data analyses eligible for this award? Yes, if they're, again, the, as uh, Tony said before, the, the major emphases for this program are innovation potential impact. So if you're bringing very new perspectives for your secondary analysis or meta analysis, that's totally fine. If, if the level of innovation rises to the degree that we expect for this program and the potential for impact is broad. Great. And if you are proposing a certain approach that requires an identifiable device and the industry that makes it, how can the application be written so that it complies with the blinding character? With the... Oh, I, I guess if by mentioning the device that you will be using, it might identify you. So I, again, just try to follow the, the guidelines as stated in the FOA. Okay. Um, uh, if I want to use the same technology to apply to COVID and ALS, could I apply for both? It's a, for a technology development application. Yes, in principle you could, uh, there are two different. The COVID-19 FOA is distinct from the uh, standard FOA. The NOC applications must be submitted in response to the, the standard FOA. And then, Tony, maybe you can answer this. Um, oh, that... wait, sorry, but, 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 but the two applications are overlapping substantially, then you cannot. Um, okay. like you're proposing the same idea, but we want to submit it's pretty much the same idea to both the no, the ALS and to the COVID-19, you could not. Okay. Um, and Tony, maybe you can answer this one. Is there a um, requirement for your percent of research effort for the Transformative Research Award? On the Transformative Research Award, no. There's no explicit requirement. It's uh, the same with a regular R01. The effort has to be commensurate with the uh, uh, input and the contribution of the respective team members, but there's no explicit requirements for this one. Excellent. Okay. 
Um, uh, is the Transformative Research Award multi-year funded or is it um, funded every year? It's funded every year. It's not multi-year funded like the New Innovator Award, which means that multi-year funding means that all the money is given in the first year of the project period and they have the entire five years or so to spend it. It is not like that for the transformative. It's like a standard R01 annual allotments are, are provided. Um, and is continuous submission allowed for TRAW submission if I'm serving as an NIH reviewer? No. I guess asking about late submissions. No, nope, it is not. It's the applications are in response to an FOA, I mean, to an RFA, so that does not uh, qualify for rolling or continuous submission. Yeah, it cannot do late submission either. It has to be on time. Yeah. Right. And can PIs discuss their ideas with the PO or SRO to gauge fit? Sure. Yes, they're welcome to speak with me if they wish. I provide what I call low resolution feedback about fit. <laughs> yes, yeah, so if you have questions about um, your scientific proposal and the scope of the initiative, uh, you should go to email our uh, mailbox at transformative underscore awards at mail.nih.gov um, and I can get you in touch with Ravi. It is not appropriate for you to send your scientific um, proposal to to Jim, uh, to scientific review officer. It should always be directed to the scientific contact. All right, um, so because of time, we're going to move on now to budget. Hello. All right, and um, our first question, how much can I ask for? <laughs> so, good question. Uh, the, the cheeky answer is much as you want to because there's no limit on the requested budget, but, but in practical terms, first of, all, first of all, the absolute limit is $8 million in total cost, which is the overall allocation to the program. And in more practical terms, as Ravi mentioned previously, we have about a, an order of magnitude difference, somewhere between 250,000 to 2.5 million have been the operative budget of the vast majority of the proposals that we see. And uh, as always, uh, you should ask for as much as you need to get the work done, uh, but the budget has to be very well justified and the higher the budget, the more re uh, stringent the justification needs to be. But the, the absolute limit is $8 million per year in total cost. Excellent. Um, and do I need NIH pre-approval to submit a budget exceeding $500,000 in annual direct costs? In, in this case, no, because the FOA specifically mentions that the budget is uncapped and we expect to receive large budgets. So for this opportunity, you do not to need to ask for advanced approval before submitting a larger than 500K budget. All right. Um, and uh, our, um, let's see, are full budgets uh, required for the application? So do I need to submit a fully justified budget? Uh, I believe so, yes. Yes, okay. Especially you need a detailed budget of the Budget request is over two hundred fifty thousand dollars in direct costs. Otherwise, it's modular. Right, and are foreign components allowed? Uh, foreign components are allowed uh, for this opportunity. As, as Ravi mentioned, the the submitting institution has to be domestic, uh, but you are welcome to engage foreign components as per the official definition. Uh, a couple of reminders on that front. If you're going to have a collaboration with anyone outside the United States, or if you're going to be receiving anything, either materials or financial support from outside the U.S., that is a foreign component, and it may require State Department clearance before approval, uh, but you are welcome to bring in foreign collaborators for these efforts. Yes. Okay. Um, we already answered that. Okay. Great. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and move on to review because there are a whole slew of review questions. All right. You ready, Jim? Yes. 
<laughs> we'll start off easy. All right. Um, do I need to suggest a study section to submit my application to? Uh, so the, the short answer is no, because all the application that's in response to this special RFA will be assigned to the same study session, which is our, will be set up by the receipt and referral. So uh, as long as you pick the right RFA number, you should be fine. Okay, great. All right, and will the COVID-19 and ALS applications be reviewed separately? Uh, no, they will be in, this, in the same panel, go through the same process. But we'll be a, have additional reviews, uh, so for criteria or consideration for those uh, uh, two subcategories. Okay. Um, will the investigator's prior publications be a consideration in the evaluation of submitted grant applications? Not at the early phases, right? As I outlined that uh, review process, uh, doing the anonymized review process, the identity of the 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 PI, the applicant, is, 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 is not disclosed to the review panel, only at the last stage, where during the review discussion where the qualification of the PI, their past accomplishment, you know, listed in their bio sketch, everything will be considered. So only the last stage. Okay. Um, and there are a lot of questions asking about, you know, what if um, the reviewers can identify me um, just by the topic area, um, you know, if I'm working on a very unique protein, um, uh, how will NIH handle it if the, the investigator can be identified? So, as uh, I guess this question was a sort of a, asking a slightly different flavor uh, early, as Ravi alluded to, I think as long as you follow the, the guideline outlining the RFA, and um, then I think it should be fine, but if if you don't, you know, if you follow the guideline, but somehow just by simply describe your application, uh, people might be able to identify it or something, then then that I think that's probably okay. And also we are instruct to the reviewer that uh, as long as there's no obvious uh, identifiable information, they should just uh, uh, focus on the signs and review the application. And, uh, you know, in the post review, we're going to uh, do some sort of evaluation as a pilot process, whether, you know, is it feasible, for example, uh, the reviewer can review without, you know, their PI's information, can, can they feel the effect of it can review the application and flip the coin was, you know, uh, can somehow some, in some cases where they can identify the, the applicant or something. Great. Um, and how do you keep reviewers um, on task with uh, not requiring preliminary data? So previous applicants have said that they didn't include preliminary data, and that was one of the critiques in their proposal of their proposal. Well, I mean, this is uh, I think uh, during the very beginning, the the, the training, just like uh, when we're doing the R twenty one typical R twenty one review, right? When which is preliminary data is not required. So the the reviewer will be instructed that this is a you know high risk, high reward program, which is a, by definition, it's an early stage of uh, the, the proposed study. And often they don't have a, you know, a lot of a preliminary data. So they sh basically should judge based on its overall concept, its potential. Uh, so uh, that way, you know, like a, not like a typical conventional R1 where you have a lot, you know, quite extensive solid preliminary data, you just propose the next logic step. Uh, that's not what we're looking for. So the review will be, um, uh, we'll go through multiple review orientation and instruction about the particular uh, special emphasis, uh, a review consideration for this particular program. Okay. Um, so I guess along that note, is the anonymized review process permanent? Uh, well, this is, uh, as we said, this is the first year we're using this. And uh, we are uh, working with an outside firm to do evaluation during the process, as well as a, in the post review, or we'll see, you know, uh, the vantage versus uh, uh, what's a shortcoming, we're gonna uh, probably modify it in the future. And uh, so uh, we can't really say now whether that's permanent or not, but this is at least a, one of the pilot we're trying uh, to see uh, if it helps. All right, and will applications that do not go through to phase one, two, et cetera, be informed 
um, of that at the end of each phase review? Uh, no, the, the applicant will not be informed uh, during the review process. It's a, a towards once everything complete, which is the next April, and once the summary uh, statement is released, everything will be released at the same time. All right, and um, how many COVID-19 applications will be included in the first cut compared to the standard FOA applications? So that will really come down to, I think, uh, um, uh, well, the short answer is we don't know at this point, but uh, we think it, depending on the number of applicants, and also, uh, I think also depends a little bit of the, the, the score we're giving in the preliminary score in the phase one, and then we'll just move from there. For example, if a lot of them are really in the low impact score, then you expect the number will be low. But, you know, if it's a comparable to, to the regular uh, TRA, then we think it probably will be the sort of a similar ratio or move forward to the next phase. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, how can reviewers fairly evaluate the validity of an idea without citation references? Okay. So once again, you know, uh, unlike the sort of conven uh, conventional R1, which is mostly supported by, you know, solid preliminary results, the TRA, you know, transformative research award is really focused on highly innovative idea, you know, transformative concept, often in sort of the early stage, right? So we think it's uh, the, the citation for reference is less critical, at least in the early stage of the review. And uh, we also uh, rely on a group of really highly accomplished senior scientists who, you know, have a broad expertise and knowledge you know, to cover our area of the sort of science relevant to NIH uh, research portfolio. And the last would be, you know, any relevant reference, if it's really, really super critical, you know, can make and break a, a project. And I think some of those critical concept ideas should be included as part of the, you know, their own uh, the, the application. Also, all the critical reference will be uh, accessible to the review panel at the end of the, uh, you know, the, towards uh, sort of the last stage of the review. So they will be considered. Okay. Um, and will all applicants get a summary statement? All applicants will get a summary statement, but uh, for those uh, application that uh, did not move to the phase three, uh, two, you know, technical review uh, stage, they will uh, get a description of the process. They will not get uh, any uh, sort of a comments, technical comments uh, for, their, uh, uh, for their application. Right. And how are reviewers selected? Uh, basically, we are looking for reviewer, uh, you know, there's a two sets of review, right? It was for the editor board member, which is a, uh, this senior scientist who has a broad experience, expertise, and we're looking for, uh, you know, their scientific accomplishment, their background, uh, their funding history, their publication record, and uh, as well as we looking, you know, the, the diversity of uh, uh, different institutes and geographic, demographic diversity are also considered, right? And for the technical reviewer, uh, sort of a similar consideration, but it's there's a more emphasis on their matching expertise, uh, you know, their technical expertise versus what the science is talking about. In their in in those particular applications. All right, and are you able to submit post submission materials such as publication updates? Uh, I think it. Yeah. Yes, I think it, it's a it's a standard policy. But I think uh, but it, if you look at the standard policy post uh, submission material. Uh, you know, it's very limited information can be submitted, a list of the recent publication. Obviously, if you submit that information that won't be available to the reviewer towards the end of the discussion, right? You have to submit 30 days before the meeting, but that will not be available to the reviewer until the last, when the uh, when anonymized review process is complete, where they can access the entire application. At that point, they will be able to to see your uh, post-meeting uh, update, post-submission update. All right, and how will reviewers avoid conflict of interest with applicants in an anonymous process? 
Okay, so we are, um, so this is a, uh, I guess a, a, one thing is uh, we are, um, when doing the assignment, right, we are um, look at, uh, we check the, you know, the publication record and, and institution conflict, and, uh, you know, all those are obvious one. And also we rely on sometimes the, the applicant will uh, send a list um, where they will identify who might be in conflict with their application and give a reason why we're going to take those into consideration. And uh, in some way, it might be easier without an identity of the uh, the PR institution, so the conflict um, maybe it's minimized that way. Okay. Um, and can I request that certain reviewers be excluded? Yes. Uh, I think the applicant can state it in the uh, their cover letter. Uh, you know, they sh but they should give a reason why, not to simply just say, well, we work in the same field, so I don't want so-and-so to be uh, the reviewer, right? Uh, they have to have a, like a longstanding different uh, sort of a disagreement professionally or personally or, or any particular uh, reason. So they should list it in their uh, cover letter, the submission. All right. And um, is it okay to contact previous reviewers to review my application prior to submission? Well, this is a tricky area. I mean, by um, I think it's better you talk to uh, your collaborator or your senior colleague discuss your idea scientifically, right? Whether this idea, what they think is transformative or this is just an incremental change in the field. So I think that's the best approach. Uh, technically, you can talk to anyone about the science, right? You just cannot talk about any particular, uh, you know, the particular review, uh, the, you know, transform research reward review, uh, you know, the, the questions relate to that review. Even somebody, you know, you can see who served on, let's say, two years ago. Um, but if you talk to them on science, sometimes it's a kind of a slippery slope, right? And it's something might, might, it might, might come up or something. So the, the reviewer who served on previous panel are also instructed that uh, they're not supposed to uh, talk about anything specific to the review. So if you call them, I think you put them in the risk you know, so so I would just suggest it's better you talk to your other collaborator or another senior colleagues that are about your idea. All right. Um, and this one I'll just open up to everybody on the panel. Um, can we list our expertise, or does this count as identifying information? Where would anything that that refers to the track record or history of accomplishment of the PI should not be described in the specific games page or the research strategy section. But the PI's qualifications will be considered at the very end of review, phase 3B. Right, and has human clinical trials ever, have they ever been funded with this mechanism? We certainly have had human uh, subject research I think we've had at least one human clinical trial. We have one application that, that focuses on design of human clinical trials. Right. And, yeah. And do you anticipate having this FOA next year? And how might this be impacted by the economy and congressional budget for NIH? We, well, we can't predict the future, but if, but we expect anyway, to have a FOA for next year. Um, I can't say anything or shouldn't say anything about uh, the likelihood of receiving an allocation next year. All right, and will mind, body, or complementary medicine, uh, medicine approaches be considered for the COVID-19 TRA? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, is the $8 million cap um, on total cost applicable yearly, or is it for the full five years? It's per year in total cost. Um, so there's questions that like, can I have an R01 or can I have an R21 um, on similar topics be simultaneously submitted? Uh, so the, the short answer is no. Uh, 
by the same policy that you can't have uh, the same proposal sent to two different institutes for review. You cannot have two proposals that are substantially the same under review at the same time, and that includes the transformative uh, R01 uh, program. Great. Um, see, if the proposal is for a clinical trial, what elements should or should not be included in the 12 page research strategy section? You should not provide any information about particular, about particular resources that you might have access to that's uh, relevant to the clinical trial. Uh, for example, which institutions or from where, which geographical area you would be recruiting subjects. Those are all belong in uh, the human subjects component of the application. And they will be considered at the end of the review. Um, and is there a channel for applications that get to phase three but are not funded um, to be funded as a regular R01? That has not happened. We have had a couple of instances of uh, applications receiving support one year as R56 awards, but other than that, no, there's no precedence for that. Because the the nature of the standard R one and this are so different. Um, does having previous NIH funding increase the likelihood of success? Uh, not in itself. Many of the applicants do have substantial records of accomplishment, but having a lot of funding uh, previously doesn't in itself increase the likelihood of success. You can have a lot of funding and, and submit to rather pedestrian ideas still. <laughs> All right, um, and during the anonymized reviews phase, phases, um, will reviewers know whether it's a single PI or a multi-PI application? Uh, they will not know until the last stage, right? When the, when the complete application is available, accessible to them, so then they can tell uh, they will instruct to review the, the, uh, the investigator and the entire team, the qualification. All right. And can you have co-investigators on the application? Yes. Yeah. Just same, same rules as far as not identifying anyone uh, in the research strategy and the specific aims for the anonymous part of the review. Good. All right, oh, we're almost there. Um, we've gotten through most of the questions. Um, some of them are more specific. I don't know, Ravi, do you wanna keep going or do you wanna stick to our one and a half hours? Well, it depends on our colleagues, but if, if they're very specific questions and we can maybe follow up through email or telephone discussions. Yeah, I think. Oh, wait, more, a bunch more just came in. All right. Um, will a sentence like patent pending be considered as revealing, uh, revealing identity? If it just says patent pending, I don't think so. If it has the patent number, then yes. <laughs> um, and can you propose, um, a tr uh, have a trial proposal um, in, uh, oh, you have overlapping scientific aims for like uh, the trial proposal with different federal agencies such as DARPA or DOE? You can have, as I think it's within HHS, you cannot have substantially overlapping proposals at the same time. Um, does the lack of a previous track record exclude us from being competitive at the last stage of review? No. The there's no prerequisite for particular productivity. The proposals are evaluated as a whole based on a number of criteria. Um, could we make an anonymous statement of field of expertise? For instance, uh, here we combine the expertise of an immunologist, a bioengineer, et cetera. 
I think that would be acceptable. Yeah. Um, okay, I think that answers it. So if the application suggests a multidisciplinary approach, um, will you need to state which disciplines or is that a violation of anonymity? They can be stated in a very broad sense, like immunologist, cell biologist. Because the science that's being proposed will be apparent to the reviewers. Okay. At least specialized or specific details about the expertise probably would not be a good idea. Um, there's, let me see if maybe you understand this better. Um, if we have an approach funded for COVID-19 through urgent competitive review, the extended project is also scored well through transformative research award. Can we relinquish, relinquish the urgent competitive review award and accept the transformative? Yes, I'm pretty sure you can. Yeah. Uh, you can always relinquish an award. <laughs> um, do you have an idea of what the percentage of successful propo proposals had preliminary data? Yeah, so most do have some level of data. Uh, maybe just very roughly, maybe 80% of the applications have data and that would be about the same as awarded. But again, I, I, not having a lot of data is not is not a good idea. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. I, I think relatively few proposals have no preliminary data at all. But at the same time, the more preliminary data is included, uh, the more likely the proposal is either to drift into the it's not really transformative, but would be more suited for a traditional R01, and also the more you're opening yourself up for potential criticism. So there's definitely a Goldilocks principle at play, and there's no uh, right or wrong answer necessarily. All right, um, and then can you just repeat again the success rate for the Transformative Research Award? In the past few years, it's been about three to five percent. Um, and then uh, can preliminary data be published figures? Preliminary data be published figures. Yeah. Yes, but it, well, it's, it's, the concern here, of course, is breach of anonymity. Uh, so you should be careful about that. If you think it's if it's easy for people to to uh, trace the figure to a publication, then that's not a good idea. Okay. Um, and there are some questions about um, how to provide a detailed budget if you don't have a detailed experimental plan. Right, so to, you have to, per NIH policy, the budget is over $250,000 in direct costs in any year. You have to provide a, uh, a budget that, a detail, it's called a detailed budget form. But you just have to do the best you can in, in justifying why you need more than 250, why you need that much money for the proposed research. That doesn't seem to be a, a real hindrance in people preparing applications or, or reviewers reviewing applications. Okay. Um, I think those are the main ones that we've gotten. Um, there's some in the chat, but it's really hard, hard to follow those within the chat. So um, if we didn't get to your questions there, please um, email us. Uh, you can see on our slide now the transformative underscore awards at mail.nih.gov for any remaining questions. Uh, we will be posting the slides and the video um, on commonfund.nih.gov slash tra. It'll be there on that home page. Also on that home page, there are um, Three different places that you can find a link to the app, the new application and award guide. Um, there's a slide that's rotating through our slide box that you can click on that. It'll take you to the guide. Also, um, on the left hand side menu, there's a link that says application and award guidance. Click on that. And also, if you scroll to the announcements on the home page, it's also listed there um, from that application and award guidance website. 
um, you'll see there's a link that says sample applications. You can click on that and see the two examples that we have posted. Um, they are redacted, so not all the information is going to be there, but it's just meant to give you a general idea of what um, some applications look like. And once again, a reminder that they're not anonymized, so it's going to be a different format from what you will be submitting for this round. Um, I think that's about it. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists for their time and for um, helping answer all these questions. And uh, I hope you guys all learned a lot. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.